Forestry's uh, Forestry Webinar Series. Uh, we're really happy to, today to have uh, Dr. Jenna Bjork with us. Uh, Jenna is from the Minnesota um, Department of Health, uh, working on and really specializing in some of these uh, mosquitoes and ticks and all these sort of vector-borne diseases um, that are really a risk uh, to a lot of humans in Minnesota. Um, and I know that Jenna will talk a lot about um, uh, sort of the history um, of the development um, of these vector-borne diseases and also sort of looking at the changing risks um, that these vector-borne uh, diseases and things that transmit them uh, have for humans uh, here in the state of Minnesota. So Jenna comes to us, uh, she did her uh, degree in animal science here at the University of Minnesota uh, and also her um, graduate degrees uh, at Iowa and uh, Iowa State University. Uh, so with that, um, I'll hand it over to Jenna and I'll just mention to people that are looking uh, and watching online um, to, if you have questions or you want clarifications, just feel free to enter them into the chat box. Uh, that's on the lower right hand corner of our WebEx system. And so I'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar um, to answer questions and field questions and, and things off to Jenna uh, as they come up. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Jenna. Thank you, Van. And thank you, everybody, for joining me today on your lunch hour. I will be talking today about diseases transmitted by mosquitoes and ticks and how uh, those risks have changed in our Minnesota forests over the years. You know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, things were a lot different and people would come across a mosquito or tick bite and just view them as a nuisance. Um, but nowadays, uh, we really have to be concerned about uh, health risks. And so I'll be sharing um, some information on that today. So as a brief outline, I'll start out by giving you an idea of what I do at the Minnesota Department of Health, the Vector Borne Disease Unit. I'll talk primarily about tick-borne diseases of Minnesota since they are uh, the most significant um, burden that we have here as well as the time of year is perfect to talk about ticks. Uh, I'll talk about a couple different mosquito-borne diseases that we have here and then I'll go into more about what we expect to find in the future for vector-borne disease and follow up with some prevention measures and how you can protect yourself. So I work in St. Paul at the Minnesota Department of Health in the Vector-Borne Disease Unit. That is in the Infectious Disease Division. We're highly specialized uh, at the Minnesota Department of Health, and so we're very fortunate um, to strictly focus on vector-borne diseases. So it's Lyme disease, West Nile virus, and so on. Um, primarily here in Minnesota, we're dealing with ticks and mosquitoes. We do get an occasional blood transfusion associated infection that we follow up on as well. And so our primary responsibilities are following disease surveillance. And so that's human cases of disease. All tick-borne and mosquito-borne diseases are reportable by law. And so we hear about them um, either through a physician diagnosing a case of illness or through a positive lab result. And then we're able to follow up on those cases and learn more about it. We have uh, also done some animal disease surveillance, particularly in the early days of West Nile virus. We were following dead bird reports um, as far and uh, equine cases. And then we also um, are following the vectors themselves. And so uh, we do some tick field studies. You can see in these pictures here, um, people always ask us, how do you go hunting for ticks? And this is what we do. Um, each year, we try to go out to at least four different sites throughout the state. and. Uh, drag for ticks and so we dress all in white we drag these white claws behind us and we um, look at ourselves and the drag cloth very closely and collect the ticks that we find um, we've been able to um, you know really understand uh, from year to year how they vary and we also test them in our laboratory uh, for different pathogens and so uh, i'll go into some of those results later we do some research uh, at the Minnesota Department of Health through a CDC collaboration called TickNet. And then also community outreach is very important to us, you know, reaching out to the general public, uh, medical providers, getting our information out there. So the next uh, part of my presentation will be on the tick-borne diseases that we have here in Minnesota. We have about a dozen different tick species here in Minnesota, but really only about three of them that are public health concern where people can come into contact with them and they could get disease from them. The black-legged tick is also known as the deer tick. Um, it's by far the most, uh, it causes the most diseases and so we're most concerned about that tick. And so you can see it can cause Lyme disease, human anaplasmosis, babesiosis, 
ehrlichiosis, and Powassan virus. And you can also see on the map there um, that it's not considered endemic to all parts of Minnesota. We do still consider it an emerging pathogen here. And so we're, um, we hear reports of it located throughout the state, and that's what part of our tick surveillance program is, is doing as well. The American dog tick, also known as the wood tick, is by far much more common. Uh, it's a lot hardier of a, of a tick, and so it is found in more open areas. And they can cause a couple different diseases, such as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Tularemia, uh, but they're very, very rare. Um, and then lastly, the Lone Star tick is possible. We've had some sporadic reports of this tick being found in the state. Um, throughout the years, but nothing that indicates it's established here. And so you can see that its current range is just encroaching into that southern part of Minnesota. Um, so that's one that can also carry disease and that we're watching closely. And if you ever happen to find it, uh, we'd be happy to see it and hear about where you found it. This is a nice picture showing those three different ticks in their life stages. And so they start out as eggs and they'll hatch into larvae and then nymphs, and then finally adults. And so this picture really shows nicely how you can differentiate um, between a dog tick and a black-legged tick. The black-legged ticks are smaller, primarily more black, with the female having some reddish-orange coloring on her back, versus the lone star tick and dog tick, which are more brown and white markings. And this is the black-legged tick life cycle. And so on average, the black-legged tick will live about two years, and in that amount of time, it, if it's lucky, it'll take about three blood meals. And so eggs will hatch into larvae, uh, typically in the late spring, early summer, like right now, uh, is when we expect them to start coming out. And they feed primarily on birds and small rodents. And it's at this stage that they could come into contact with a disease agent and acquire something. And so um, we, we aren't aware of any diseases that ticks are actually born with. So that's a good thing. And then if they're lucky enough to get a blood meal, um, they fall off and then they will molt into a nymph, um, typically that next spring. And so the nymphs also come out, what we say typically mid-May, um, up and through um, early parts of July, mid-July. And as nymphs, they can either um, feed on a smaller rodent, acquire another disease agent, um, or they can feed on larger mammals and pass an infection. And so after that stage, then they'll molt into an adult, and adults primarily feed on the larger mammals, um, such as white-tailed deer people, uh, if we come into contact with them. After taking that blood meal from a larger mammal, um, they'll mate, the female will drop off, lay her eggs, and die, and then the cycle repeats. So these are the black-legged tick larvae. You can notice the very, very small uh, stage of the life uh, of the tick, and you can see them on this poor little mouse's ear. They're about the size of a period at the end of the sentence, so you can see them with the naked eye, uh, but very, very difficult. Fortunately, they're not known to transmit any disease agents um, because it's at this stage that they can acquire um, a bacteria or something from, from the white-footed mouse. Black-legged tick nymphs are then the next stage, and I call these the very small stage. They're about the size of a poppy seed, and so you can see it on the fingernail there to um, give you some perspective. And these are the ones that we're most worried about in terms of disease transmission because they're so small, they're difficult to find and get off of you right away, and they can carry disease. The next stage are the black-legged tick adults, and so these are just the small stage, about the size of a sesame seed when they're unfed, uh, but they can get quite big um, after they've been feeding and are fully engorged, uh, more towards the size of a watermelon seed. They'll feed and mate in the early spring, uh, and you can also see them active out in the fall. And this is where you're primarily going to find the black-legged ticks, and so this is ideal habitat. You know, you can see the thick leaf layer down below, the nice dense shrub layer, uh, as well as a nice thick canopy layer up above. Deciduous woods are great. Mixed forests are pretty good. Um, the coniferous forests, you can find uh, black-legged ticks there, but the pine needles you know, just don't provide enough um, protection for them. But you can still find them there. Um, the black-legged tick, like I said, isn't as hardy as the wood tick, and so they need a lot of moisture and humidity in order to survive. And so dog ticks 
uh, or wood ticks, uh, you'll find more in grassy uh, wooded areas compared to the shrubby and, and wooded areas like the black-legged tick. And so when you consider where you're going to find this in Minnesota, um, you can look at our natural biomes and see that, you know, that south west corner of the state that's primarily prairie area, uh, agricultural use, we just don't deem that as, as high risk as the central, north central, um, and southeastern corners of the state. And the map that I have here on the right shows our current tick-borne disease risk map. And we've made that based on the cases of Lyme disease and anaplasmosis that we've had. And um, you can note that it, it really does follow the natural um, biomes of the state pretty well along the wooded corridors. This is a nice slide showing when you're going to expect to find the ticks out. And so disease risk, when you think about it, when and where are you going to come across these black-legged ticks? And so with the adults, they will start to come out typically in the spring, right after the snow melts. Typically degrees have to be over about 40 degrees uh, for them to become active. You know, they'll be a little slow, at, you know, on a day like today, um, but typically around 55, 60 degrees, they're pretty happy. Um, and humidity is certainly very important, so it can vary from day to day and, and time of day. But uh, you'll see a nice peak in the spring, early summer for adults, and then again in the fall. On the nymphs, on the other hand, they typically come out, like I said, mid-May, are out until um, July, and then go back down when it gets really hot and dry. This is a nice slide that shows how ticks find their hosts, and so they go through a process called questing. And so what they do, the ticks live in the leaf litter on the forest floor. And when, they, when the conditions are right, they will venture out and just sit on a piece of vegetation put their arms out and wait for an animal or a human to walk by. And so they don't have eyes, they can't see, you know, their, their hosts walking by, but they sense other biochemicals such as carbon dioxide, heat, vibrations, that sort of thing. And once they climb onto a host, then they'll climb up. Um, a lot of people think that they jump, they fly, they'll fall from treetops, but they don't do these things. A lot of people find them in their hair or behind their ear or something simply because they've walked from the ground up. Um, or, I mean, certainly if you're rolling around in the leaves or fall down, you can get them that way as well. In terms of disease transmission, three things must be met. And so the tick must be able to transmit a disease during feeding. The, Life stages that we're most worried about are the nymphs and the adult females. Adult males really don't take enough of a blood meal to transmit diseases. It's possible for them to transmit uh, one of the diseases called Powassan, um, but in terms of risk, you know, really worry about the nymphs and the adult females. Two, uh, the tick must be infected with disease agents. So as I'll show in the next slide, not all ticks are infected with disease, but a high proportion of them are. And then the tick must be attached for a certain amount of time. The entire feeding process for a black-legged tick actually takes about three to five days on average. And so it does take time um, during that process to attach, start feeding, and start transmitting a disease agent. So for Lyme disease, we know that it takes at least 20, 40, 24 to 48 hours of attachment in order to transmit the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. It can take a little bit shorter for anaplasmosis and a little bit longer for babesiosis. Powassan virus, um, I think was very rare, has been shown in mice studies to uh, transmit in possibly as little as 15 minutes. Um, but overall, the, the main message of this is check yourself really frequently for ticks. Get them off as soon as you can, at least once a day, um, and, and you'll drastically reduce your risk of disease if you find them quickly enough. And so with this slide, it shows our, some preliminary results that we've had over the years. Like I said, with our tick studies, we go throughout the state um, and we've had these four different locations that we've monitored, it, um, we try to every year anyway, and we've tested them for different disease agents. And so it does vary from site to site and from year to year as far as how many ticks are infected with a disease agent. But on average, about one in three adult ticks will carry the bacteria for Lyme disease, and about one in five nymphs uh, will carry the disease for Lyme disease. 
Remember that nymphs, they've only had one opportunity to feed from a reservoir host to get a disease agent. And so adults have had two opportunities, so that's why we see a higher infection prevalence with them. For anaplasmosis, uh, it's more about six to seven percent of, of ticks are infected, and as well as babesiosis. For a lichiomurus-like agent, it's a very uncommon tick-borne disease. Um, as well as Powassan virus, which isn't on here, they're more about 2 to 3 percent um, infection prevalence. Another important thing that isn't on here that's important to keep in mind is that about 1 in 12 ticks is co-infected, and so meaning that they actually have uh, one or more, more than one uh, tick-borne disease agent. So keep that in mind if you do get sick and talk to your doctor about possibly testing for multiple um, disease agents. So this might be a good uh, place to stop before I start talking about the specific diseases themselves and see if we have any questions. Uh, no questions yet from online. So All right. Feel free to move ahead. Oh, yeah. You mentioned uh, you, when you're doing this surveys out in the field mm -hmm. that the populations can vary from year to year. I'm just curious as to what, what drives the population levels up and down. Well, that's a good question. Um, I wish we knew the answer to that because it can, I mean, we try to keep everything as consistent as possible when we go out sampling so that we can tell what's different. Um, but things like just time of day, I mean, if we go out um, early in the morning, we try to go out um, when the dew has evaporated already so that it's not too wet. But certainly you don't want to do it, you know, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when it, the sun is really bright and it's really dry either. Um, so from just time of day, um, uh, ticks out questing can be different. Um, also, I would say that temperature and humidity are probably the most important factors. From year to year, um, also snowfall um, can, can really make an impact on their survival throughout the winter. Um, snowfall is really, um, if there's a nice layer of snow, it can insulate the ticks and help them. Um, but if there's really nothing and we have some really cold winters, um, that's got to have an impact on the survival. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. One question from online, Jim. Have you done any comparative sampling for ticks in areas that have a history of prescribed burning or fire? Yeah, well, uh, not any, you know, um, well described studies but one of our sites does go through a pretty regular burn cycle and I know we've heard from you know people asking if that's a good method to control ticks and unfortunately with this site it's uh, it's one of our most densely populated sites um, and so what we found is that with burning practices it'll dampen their populations temporarily and then they come back uh, in pretty good force um, once the vegetation comes back. Anything else? Keep going. All right, so with these, um, I'm going to talk about five different diseases that the black-legged tick um, can spread here in Minnesota. I'll go over them briefly, and overall, I want you to just be aware of the general signs of tick-borne illness being fever, muscle aches, joint aches, and rash. Uh, and fatigue. And so if you're sick after having a tick bite, after being in wooded areas, because not everybody even notices a tick bite, um, go to your doctor and, and get checked out. So Lyme disease is by far the most common disease that we have here in Minnesota. It's caused, and around the United States, it's caused by the bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. And typically symptoms will start within about a month of having a tick bite. The most common symptom is this classic bullseye rash. If you get this, you can go into the doctor. You actually don't need any blood work done at all, uh, and they can diagnose you based on this alone. It's typically circular and at least two inches in size, but what it does, it, it'll expand over time, and so you'll want to note that key finding. And it usually has a central clearing, but it doesn't need to. Um, it's also not it's usually not itchy or painful, um, so sometimes people think of a rash as being an itchy rash, but it can just be a, a skin blotch. Um, if you don't notice the rash or you don't um, 
because it can be in hard to find places sometimes, or not everybody gets the rash. If the illness isn't treated uh, right away, you can come down with symptoms, um, you know, months after a tick bite as well. And it can affect uh, several different body systems, such as the joints, uh, it can affect the heart, um, facial paralysis is, is a possibility, as well as uh, the central nervous system. But essentially diagnosis, you know, go talk to your doctor, have a physical exam done to look for this rash, um, otherwise blood work um, is, is also available. And it's uh, very effectively treated with antibiotics with an appropriate course of antibiotics. Anaplasmosis is our second most common tick-borne disease that we have here in Minnesota, and it's caused by a bacteria called Anaplasma phagocytophila. I put ehrlichiosis on here as well because they're very similar diseases. Ehrlichiosis is a disease caused by Ehrlichia chaffiensis and Ewingii. They are uncommon here in Minnesota, but we actually have a strain called Ehrlichia murus-like agent that is endemic to Minnesota. It was detected back in 2009, and after interviewing cases of the disease, um, it, it appears to be unique to Minnesota and Wisconsin in the upper Midwest here. Uh, symptoms for both of these diseases are similar. Um, most cases actually have no symptoms at all, and people don't even realize that they were infected. Um, but for those cases that do come down with illness, uh, fever, headache, muscle aches, um, are the most common symptoms. Oftentimes people describe being hit like, hit like a bus. Um, it comes on very suddenly and with very serious um, symptoms. Laboratory tests are used to diagnose it and again antibiotics um, effectively treat this. Babesiosis is our third most common tick-borne disease that we have here in Minnesota. And this is actually caused by a parasite called Babesia microti. Symptoms um, can occur anywhere from a month, um, but it can take a little bit longer um, for symptoms of illness. Again, a lot of cases don't even know that they became infected with this. Their immune system is able to take care of it. Um, but for people with illness, fever, headache, fatigue, muscle aches, um, these are the most common symptoms. It attacks the red blood cells of the body, and so anemia and weakness um, are also um, possible. Again, laboratory testing with blood work is how we diagnose it, and treatment combines um, an antiprotozole and an antibiotic, so two different medications are used to treat this illness. Lastly, Powassan disease is caused by a virus that is closely related to West Nile virus. And so this is very rare. Um, we're still fully evaluating it and learning about the clinical spectrum of disease. We suspect that it's much more common than we know about because we hear about the most severe cases that end up being hospitalized and tested. Um, but we have a feeling that a lot of cases, you know, were able to overcome it. Maybe they just had a mild uh, fever and short illness and never went in to get tested. Um, but like I said, the, the cases that we hear about are severe, can cause encephalitis and meningitis, where the virus can affect the brain or linings layering, uh, surrounding the brain. Laboratory testing is required to diagnose this. And because it's a virus, there isn't a specific medication, um, but simply supportive care. The next two diseases that I'll talk about are spread by the um, wood tick or the American dog tick. And so I'll mention them briefly because they're possible here in Minnesota, but they're very rare. Uh, the first one is called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It's caused by the bacteria called Rickettsia rickettsii. Symptoms come about a week after having the tick bite. And again, um, the general tick-borne disease illness symptoms, such as fever, headache, muscle aches, fatigue, um, are, are the most commonly found symptoms, but they also get this characteristic rash like I have in this picture here, and it'll start on the uh, feet and hands and work its way towards the trunk. And if you find this on you, uh, certainly go in to see your provider and get treatment started right away. We get probably just a handful of cases a year in, here in Minnesota. And then tularemia is the last disease that I'll mention. This is uh, even more rare than Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Uh, we haven't had a case in several years here in Minnesota, but it's also caused by a bacteria called Francisella tularensis. Symptoms can occur typically within a week of that tick bite. Again, fever, headache, um, 
and it actually depends on how the bacteria was introduced to the body. You can actually get this um, through a tick bite, also through like a, a horsefly bite or something like that. Um, and hunting uh, sick or dead road, uh, rabbits, I'm sorry, is another way that people can get affected with this disease. And so it can vary. It can affect your respiratory tract if you, track, if you happen to inhale it. It can cause a skin ulcer if you happen to get a bug bite um, and that sort of thing. So diagnosis is through, again, blood work and readily treated with antibiotics um, and very rare here in Minnesota. So switching gears a little bit, uh, those were all of our tick-borne disease cases. And as I had said right now is really when we're stressing, be aware of ticks um, because they're out and about. Um, and then again in the fall, ticks will come back out, so be aware about tick-borne diseases. But late summer, early fall is when we actually worry more about um, mosquito-borne disease. And so here in Minnesota, uh, we've got probably about uh, 50 different species of mosquitoes, but again, only a few different species that we worry about in terms of disease transmission. We've got a lot of pest species here in Minnesota. And so two different diseases that um, are our most common endemic diseases that we have here are West Nile virus, caused by the species called Culex tarsalis, and lacrosse encephalitis virus, which is caused by Aedes triseriatus, also known as the wood uh, tree hole mosquito. At the Minnesota Department of Health, certainly we're aware of other tropical mosquito-borne diseases, and uh, we do get reports, particularly in immigrants or travelers, and so malaria, dengue, uh, chikungunya, and Zika virus are, are certainly possibilities as well. So first of all, West Nile virus is a disease that was first identified in the United States in 1999, and over the course of just a few years, it made its way across the entire United States. The first case that we had here in Minnesota was found in 2002, and like I said, here in Minnesota, our primary vector is Culex tarsalis. So the next slide, I'll talk more about the vector itself. But with this virus, um, typically cases have no symptoms. You can see on this pyramid here, about 80% are asymptomatic. About 20% have you know, a mild illness uh, known as West Nile fever. And then less than 1% of cases have disease that affects their central nervous system, such as meningitis or encephalitis. Death is possible, um, but very rare. And with these more severe cases, we worry most about our elderly population and people with weakened immune systems. Laboratory testing involves blood work or a spinal tap if, if your illness involves your central nervous system. And there isn't a specific uh, medication, just supportive care. So Culex tarsalis is a species of mosquito that's widely distributed in the western United States, and it lives around these semi-permanent bodies of water, such as wetlands, um, drainage ditches, more in that um, prairie agricultural areas of the state. And so you can see with our West Nile virus risk map here, it looks a lot different than our tick-borne disease risk map. And this species of mosquito feeds on a wide range of species. It prefers birds, um, and it's most active at dusk and dawn. And so with this, um, with the virus, it cycles between um, the birds and the mosquitoes in its natural environment. It will amplify, the virus will amplify with high heat. Um, and so typically towards the end of summer is when we start to see our cases. Um, one, because the virus amplifies and gets to high enough quantities to really um, cycle between and infect more hosts, but also um, birds start to learn defensive behaviors and the mosquito starts to uh, feed more on mammals towards the end of summer as well. You can see that people and horses down here can um, get sick with this illness. However, we're considered dead-end hosts in that we don't transmit the virus um, to other mosquitoes. Lacrosse encephalitis is another illness. Um, we had just a few reports of illness last year, and so it's, it's certainly not a common disease, um, but is considered endemic here in Minnesota. We had our first, um, it, it's named after La Crosse, Wisconsin, where a Minnesota resident went um, for treatment um, and unfortunately passed away. But it was a child um, who died in the La Crosse, Wisconsin hospital, so that's why it's named La Crosse virus. 
and that happened in the early 1960s. It spread by the vector called Aedes triseriatus, also known as the tree hole mosquito. And symptoms are, again, those, those generic symptoms of fever, headache, fatigue, um, and it can affect the central nervous system, um, causing encephalitis or meningitis. We have a feeling that you know there's a lot more cases that we just don't hear about and where people are able to fight it off on their own. And in contrast to West Nile virus that affects more of the older population, this virus affects children with our average case age more around six years of age. And laboratory testing is required to diagnose it. And again, um, supportive care is the only treatment. So with the tree hole mosquito, it's found in the eastern United States. And here in Minnesota, um, we've, we've had our cases primarily down in that southeast corner of Minnesota. Um, it's slowly expanding in recent years. We've had a case up in Stearns County, and so you can see um, it has the potential to spread. Um, but we actually do case site investigations of every site that we, of every case that we get reported to us so that we can intervene and um, keep the number of cases low. And so it's a forest dwelling mosquito. That natural habitat is the picture that I have here of the tree hole um, where two tree trunks will come together and some water will accumulate in there and that's its natural environment. However, it really is fond of trash <laughs> from man-made containers as well. Tires are big culprits and seem to be uh, wonderful breeding grounds, um, but as well as any anything could become um, breeding ground for this larvae. Flower pots, um, coolers, really anything that can hold a small amount of water um, can be um, potential breeding grounds for this species. It feeds on a variety of different species and prefers you know, small rodents such as chipmunks and squirrels. And it, it's a daytime feeder in contrast to the dusk and dawn feeding of the Culex tarsalis mosquito. And then this is just showing um, how the luck cross virus um, cycles between the mosquito vector and the primary reservoir is the chipmunk shown here. And then again, people, when we are in the woods, um, children can become affected by it if they happen to be bit by an infected mosquito. So I guess I could stop for some more questions again. One question uh, from our Grand Rapids broadcast site. Does each tick disease have its own antibiotic or are there one or more antibiotics for multiple diseases? Yeah, so that will depend on the tick-borne illness itself. Um, the doxycycline is by far the most common, um, commonly known antibiotic that treats several different um, tick-borne diseases. But with Lyme disease, for instance, it can be treated by um, several different antibiotics, um, such as amoxicillin um, for children or, or someone if they had um, a reaction to doxycycline. Any other questions? For the lab blood test for Lyme disease, is it 100% accurate? That, <laughs> that will vary depending on um, the timing of the illness. For instance, the blood work um, that's used to diagnose Lyme disease is based on antibodies. And so those are the proteins that your body makes um, when it comes across an illness. And so early on in the course of disease, when you may have just the rash, your body hasn't had enough time to make the antibodies, and so blood work um, at that time isn't very um, sensitive to picking it up, and so that's why we recommend if doctors you know, find the rash, just treat it um, because blood work won't be very sensitive in picking it up. But actually in the later courses of disease, um, if somebody has been sick for over a month, for instance, um, it has been found to be uh, very sensitive and a good test. This next one is an interesting one. One final question before you get back to the slides. Mm -hmm. So why can't humans use the same method of protection as dogs? <laughs> yeah, there's uh, another good question. We can use uh, similar formulations, um, but we don't have a product that we just put on the back of our neck and last for a month. That would be uh, pretty convenient. Um, and I guess biology is is where it comes down to, and uh, 
maybe some FDA clearance <laughs> as well. There'd be a lot, of, a whole lot of testing that would be needed to uh, approve a product like that in people. Um, yeah. Anything else? With Lyme's disease, will the antibiotic cure the disease, or I have a friend who had has been extending many, many years of having had Lyme disease, and it, uh, is there a cure for that? Um, yeah, that's another good question um, that we get asked a lot. And with uh, one important thing to keep in mind is that with Lyme disease, you can get it several times, and so just because you've had it once don't consider yourself immune to getting it in the future and so it's hard to maybe um, decipher between an active infection a past infection or a new infection um, because we have had cases come down with two bouts of Lyme disease just in the same season um, antibiotics themselves are very effective in killing the bacteria and so they have had some nice studies that have been done that have been shown to kill the bacteria. However, in a small population, um, about 10% of patients with Lyme disease will have what's known as post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And so that's where the symptoms of Lyme disease continue and linger. And so we are still researching why that happens in that subset of the population. Um, but there's nothing that's shown that antibiotics are effective in um, treating that and so we really urge providers to treat the symptoms rather than trying to treat the infection because what we found is that the bacteria appears to be killed um, and so symptomatic treatment is much better and long-term antibiotics can have negative consequences so all right keep going okay so I wanted to take a few minutes and just talk about uh, the possible future that we have in vector-borne diseases in Minnesota in regards to climate change, you know, lots of different factors. And as you've seen in my talk so far, um, tick and mosquito-borne mosquito diseases are multifactorial and dynamic. They're changing all the time, so it really is hard to predict what's going to happen. Um, we have the disease agent to consider, the animal host, the vector, human behavior and the environment are all different factors um, that need to come together in order to predict what exactly is going to happen. One thing that we can do is look at our past and see what's been happening. And so this is a nice graphic that shows our Lyme disease cases by their county of residence uh, from 1996 to 2013. And so you can really see how the disease has spread um, according to how the black-legged tick um, has spread as well. Also, what we've known, um, there is some variation in the number of cases that we have each year, but on um, the trend you can see is clearly going up. And so our numbers of Lyme disease are going up, our numbers of anaplasmosis and babesiosis are also going up throughout the years. And then lastly, this slide shows the types of diseases that we've been tracking over the years. And so, you know, prior to 1980, we had a few diseases that we were worried about in vector-borne disease. And now, um, you know, particularly since 2000, in the past 15 years, we've had new diseases come out, um, both mosquito-borne and tick-borne diseases. And so when we think about climate change and how that will affect different um, vector and disease agent systems that we have here, I hope I've, I've given you some indication that it really depends on the system itself. And so in terms of tick-borne disease risk that we have here and looking at the black-legged tick, it really has these specific set of uh, conditions for their microhabitat in order to be favorable for them. And so if climate change um, increase the temperature, increase the precipitation, humidity, um, increase their forest habitat or their host populations, these would all be very favorable for the black-legged tick. Um, certainly, you know, if it's too wet or too hot, um, that wouldn't be good and their populations could decrease. Um, so if we look at one of these things, increasing the temperature may lead to a longer tick feeding season. You know, um, maybe instead of May to June, the tick is able to come out now in April and, um, and have a little bit longer season. It could also have some lower mortality in the winter, 
We could get new tick species coming up, such as that Lone Star tick that I mentioned. If we have milder winters, the Lone Star tick could possibly become more established here. Um, and humidity is also another important factor. Um, so if we just get some wetter conditions, that black-legged tick is more apt to survive. Um, certainly flooding conditions wouldn't be good though. So there's a, a fine range here that would make um, things more suitable for the black-legged tick. Now looking at mosquito-borne disease risk and looking at the two different diseases that we have endemic here, these two actually contrast and compare very nicely with each other. West Nile virus is a virus that does well during very warm and dry conditions in contrast to lacrosse virus that actually uh, does well in warm and wet conditions. So it really depends on climate change and what's going to happen. In addition, land use is very important to keep in mind too. West Nile virus does really well in those agricultural areas uh, versus lacrosse virus that does very well in forested habitat. And then when you consider, you know, the virus, the vector, the animal host, then you have to factor in human factors. And then all bets are off, really. So with regards to humans um, and climate change, we have to consider, you know, maybe um, people are going to want to move here to Minnesota because we're a nice temperate climate, we have a very water-rich landscape, uh, we could get um, the introduction of different diseases through immigration and travel of infected people. Um, but human behavior is also important to keep in mind uh, as far as recreational hobbies, occupational risks. Um, if people continue to just sit at home and watch video games, that's a lot different risk um, than going out in the woods and hiking around. Land use is another important consideration. Um, if there are drastic changes in that southwest uh, corner of Minnesota, you know, and, and more wooded habitat pops up, then certainly we'll be looking at that more in risk of, of tick-borne disease. And then medicine and public health is also um, a couple more factors that we should keep in mind too. So lastly, I need to mention some um, prevention messages as far as how to protect yourself because everything I've said so far sounds really scary and I'm sure none of you want to go out into the woods anymore. But there are a lot of health benefits to being outside, getting out in the woods, walking your dog. Um, and so, you know, just be aware, know how to protect yourself. In terms of tick-borne diseases, being aware and knowing when and where you're at risk are probably the most important things that you can do. So know that mid-May through mid-July is when you really need to be vigilant and checking yourself over for those really small nymphs. Um, and particularly in wooded and brushy areas. Um, when you're going into tick habitat, look at yourself during and after and perform those tick checks really religiously at least once a day um, and remove them as soon as possible. Last year we made a nice video that's available on our website so you can look at how to remove a tick. Essentially, um, don't think about it too much. Just get it off you as soon as possible. If you have to use your fingers, remove it. If you have the, uh, if you remove it and the mouth parts happen to stay back and inside your skin, you may get a little bit of irritation, um, like a sliver. Uh, you can clean the area, watch it for signs of infection, go into the doctor if that happens. Um, but it hasn't been shown to increase your chances of getting a tick-borne disease at all. And so bottom line is, find those ticks, get them off you as soon as possible. Wearing tick repellent is also a very good um, prevention method. We recommend a two-tiered approach, and so using products with DEET, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30% is effective and safe. You can use that on your skin or your clothing, and it'll repel on both ticks and mosquitoes. Permethrin is another really nice product that you can apply on clothing. Don't use it on your skin, um, but it will actually last for several weeks on average and through different washings. And so it's a really nice product, especially for people that are going out in the woods frequently. Um, and it has the added advantage of actually killing the ticks, not just repelling them. Some other prevention methods that you can do, treat your pets with effective flea and tick preventatives. You can talk with your vet about lots of different options out there as far as topical products and some newer oral products that work for ticks. 
Um, and you can also modify your landscape. So if you live in a heavily wooded area or have a cabin in, a, in the woods, um, there are some things that you can do to help um, make it less friendly for ticks. Some things would be to keep the trails mowed really short, uh, remove the leaf litter and brush as much as possible. And you can also create a nice little barrier between the woods and the yard, um, essentially making it nice and dry so that the ticks um, can't survive there as well. In terms of mosquito-borne diseases, again, know when and where you're at risk. And so think about the primary risk period being the end of summer. We will be getting our pest mosquitoes to be hatching and coming out soon. Um, and But we want you to know that just because the numbers don't seem bad at the end of summer, remember to wear your insect repellent because that's when we're actually worried about the disease transmission. Um, Western agricultural areas of the state are where we worry most about West Nile, um, but also the southeast corner and the wooded areas uh, for lacrosse virus. Avoiding mosquito bites are, are great. <laughs> no one likes to get bitten by a mosquito. And so avoiding activities from dusk to dawn, wearing long sleeve shirts and long pants, loose fitting clothing is best because tight clothing, they can still bite you through that. Um, and look at your window and door screens. Make sure that they're uh, working correctly so you can keep them out of your house. And again, wear the mosquito repellent. DEET, permethrin are great products, and there are other uh, products available as well. And then there are some things that you can do around your house, around your cabin, um, to try to reduce mosquito breeding um, opportunities. And so remove any standing water that you can particularly in the spring. Now is a great time to go out there before the vegetation is leafed out and you can find things a lot easier. And so anything that could hold water can become a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So looking for toys, cans, flower pots, tires are a big culprit um, for holding water. Change the water in your bird baths at least once a week um, to keep that um, clean. Keep the children's wading pools empty and on their sides. That's something that often gets forgotten about uh, during winter and, and can collect water. Recycle the old tires or store them where they can't collect rainwater. You can also drill holes in them or you can bring them out into a very sunny area because if it gets too hot, then the mosquitoes won't use it um, for breeding. Check your gutters, clean the leaves out frequently so that they don't hold water. And if you do happen to find any natural tree holes, you can fill them in with dirt or sand um, to prevent mosquitoes from using it. And so that's about it that I had um, for my talk today. I guess, you know, bottom line is uh, be aware um, that things are changing here in Minnesota in the forest. Be on the lookout for ticks, um, really use prevention methods. And in terms of climate change, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen. And bottom line is we know things will change. Um, some things, some diseases may be favored um, and increase, but other diseases um, may be hindered and decrease, actually. So if you have any questions, I can take them now. Otherwise, please use us as a resource. If you ever have questions in the future, um, you can give us a call, email me. We have a nice website too that you can go to for more information. So thank you very much. And any questions? Yes. Uh, we have one question from online going back to the repellents. Um, mm -hmm. Zachary heard that tick repellents uh, like D um, are used, but also what about the essential oils and mixing those with water? Um, do you know the credibility and how effective um, those repellent might be? Yeah, um, I, I don't know offhand as far as how effective they are. I've heard some anecdotal reports and there are some, um, I wouldn't say it's as effective as DEET um, or permethrin, but there can be some efficacy. And so it's, it may be better than nothing. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, hard to say as far as um, numbers, I, I couldn't tell you. So. Yeah. In the Forestry Suppliers Catalog yesterday, I noticed there's a product that's supposed to encourage the ticks to release, um, to dissolve the cement for the cement, and so they're easier to release. And I was wondering if there oh. was a, um, any um, problems or reasons why that wouldn't be a good thing to use. 
Oh, I'm not aware of that product, so I'll have to look into it. It um, looks like it's something you daub on the tick before you pull them out and it uh -huh. obtain easier release of the tick. Did it say how long you need to let it sit there? It sounded like minutes. Okay, so not too long anyway, so that's good. Um, yeah, I can't speak to that. I guess I would worry mostly about skin irritation, um, you know, if you're putting something directly on your skin, plus you have a tick bite. Um, and so I guess I can't say, but I would worry mostly about skin irritation with that. Yeah, I'll have to look into it. Thanks for mentioning it. Yeah. One other question. I mean, you mentioned, you know, investigating things like climate change and things like changes in land use that might influence these populations. So who else is the Department of Health, Health working with uh, in the state of Minnesota and other agencies? Because I mean, these are all very big issues that affects um, things like mosquitoes and tick populations. So just curiosity about who else you work with uh, to answer these uh, questions. Yeah. You know, we do have a lot of different um, collaborations. I mean, with, with lots of different projects, you know, not just climate change. I know at the CDC, um, that's who our, our primary funding is through, and so they certainly have a lot of initiatives with uh, climate change. And also the um, Environmental Health Unit at the Minnesota Department of Health um, is doing a lot with climate change, and we've been working with them. So. Um, but yeah, certainly at university, I mean, there's lots of different people that we can collaborate with and, and we're always open to things. So. Great. Uh, well, uh, I hope everyone uh, here in St. Paul and, and uh, joining us online, thank Jenna for her time today. Uh, and I took a look at the, the Minnesota Department of Health website, uh, really great resources there, uh, that great video um, that Jenna mentioned, How to Remove Ticks, is online, and I shared that in the chat area, so encourage folks to, to visit the website that Jenna lists here uh, for more information about these kinds of diseases. Um, I also just want to mention our next webinar uh, coming up on June 23rd. Um, Carrie Pike will be joining us talking about genetics and silviculture as a part of our next forestry webinar series. So uh, with that, thanks Jenna, and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.